in what he termed the Noble Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path involves a series of aspects of behaving right and wisely. Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. What strikes the Western observer is the notion that wisdom is a habit, not merely an intellectual realization. One must exercise one's nobler impulses on a regular basis, as one would train a limb. The moment of understanding is only one part of becoming a better person. After his death, the Buddha's followers collected his sutras, sermons, or sayings into scripture and developed texts to guide followers in meditation, ethics, and mindful living. The monasteries that had developed during the Buddha's lifetime grew and multiplied throughout China and East Asia. For a time, Buddhism was particularly uncommon in India itself, and only a few quiet groups of yellow-clad monks and nuns roamed the countryside, meditating quietly in nature. But then, in the 3rd century BC, an Indian king named Ashoka grew troubled by the wars he had fought and converted to Buddhism. He sent monks and nuns far and wide to spread the practice. Buddhist spiritual traditions spread across Asia and eventually throughout the world. Buddha's followers divided into two main schools, Theravada Buddhism, which colonized Southeast Asia, and Mahayana Buddhism, which took hold in China and Northeast Asia. Today, there are between a half and one and a half billion Buddhists in both East and West, following the Buddha's teachings and seeking a more enlightened and compassionate state of mind. Intriguingly, the Buddha's teachings are important regardless of our spiritual identification. Like the Buddha, we're all born into the world, not realizing how much suffering it contains, and unable to fully comprehend that misfortune, sickness, and death will come to us too. As we grow older, this reality often feels overwhelming, and we may seek to avoid it altogether. But the Buddha's teachings remind us of the importance of facing suffering directly. We must do our best to liberate ourselves from the grip of our own desires, and recognize that suffering can be viewed as part of our common connection with others, spurring us to compassion and gentleness. Another one that you can follow up if you like to is this uh, school of life. <coughs> so the key principles there include the four noble truths and the noble eightfold path. We're going to look in, in those in much more depth as we go through the session, what they really mean and, and go back through them. A little bit about sacred texts. Uh, let's look about this and let's help uh, have Buddha Bits help us to do that. Christians read the Bible. Jews read the Torah. Muslims read the Koran. Do Buddhists have a holy book? In many Buddhist traditions, the Pali Canon is looked to as the source of Buddhist teachings, Buddhist scriptures, if you will. During the time Buddha lived, writing was in its infancy and didn't exist in the areas where Buddha lived and taught. As a result, Buddhist teachings were passed on orally for over 400 years. In 29 BCE, the fourth Buddhist council was held in Sri Lanka. There, Buddhist followers agreed that his teachings needed to be preserved in writing, and so they did, using the Pali language, hence the Pali Canon. The Pali Canon is also referred to as Tipitaka, which means three baskets. You also say three Tipitaka. Three baskets that comprise the canon are the rules for monks and nuns, the teachings of the Buddha, and the teachings that came about after Buddha's death related to philosophy, psychology, and metaphysics. The second basket, known as Sutta Pitaka, or basket of threads, is probably what is studied by most Buddhists. Many students of Buddhism practice calligraphy, by copying the sutras, either for learning, as a form of meditation, or even to create inspirational art. The Pali Canon is considered central to Theravada Buddhism. However, it is not the only Buddhist canon. There is a Chinese canon and a Tibetan canon. Have you studied the sutras? Share your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. To learn more about the Pali Canon, visit palicanon.org. If you like our videos, please click like and subscribe, and be sure to tell your friends. He actually asked me as well for suggestions about upcoming videos. So if any of you also have um, you know, ideas or stuff like, oh, I want to know more about that, we can pass it on as well. So that's, uh, I passed on a couple of ideas I had, and uh, 
So um, I think he's doing a good job. They're nice. They're nice to keep them short like this. You, often these Buddha uh, videos are made by monks, and monks do them for one hour long or something like that. They come out of meditation, they click the camera on, and they blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> that's a bit of a problem. But people who like this, nice little chunks that you can get hold of. So another one I like is the enthusiastic Buddhist. She explains about uh, early Buddhist developments. Uh, her name is Minda Lee Kumar. She's an Australian, I assume, from her voice. The enthusiastic Buddhist. I will be getting in touch with her in the week as well. So, um, yeah, tree pitaka or tea pitaka, same thing. Uh, Hi everyone, and welcome to the enthusiastic Buddhist. In this episode, I want to talk about how the Buddhist teachings are recorded and what are considered to be some of the important Buddhist scriptures. So, after the Buddha left this world and passed into Parin, Maha Parinibbana, which is a state completely free of clinging and characterized by the highest bliss and wisdom. His followers of monks came together in a place called Rajagaha, now known as Rajhir. Now that the Buddha was gone, they wanted to recollect and remember all the Buddha's teachings before any of it was forgotten, changed, or became corrupted. It was Mark Kasapa, one of the Buddha's most distinguished disciples, that called this meeting. He summoned 500 arhats to participate in what became known as the First Buddhist Council. Now, arhats are people who realize the Buddha's teachings and become liberated from the cycle of birth and death. They've attained nirvana and are free of all mental defilements and karma. They're not people with ordinary capacities, but people of extraordinary wisdom and abilities. Now, Ananda, who was the Buddhist loyal attendant throughout his whole life, was also summoned as one of the, one of the 500 arhats. However, it was said that he had not attained the state of an arhat before the meeting. This was because during the Buddha's life, he had little time to practice because he was always looking after the Buddha. But in the night before the meeting, as Ananda placed his head to his pillow to sleep, he also achieved the state of an arhat. So the following day, he was able to gather with the other 499 arhats. Now, Ananda had the power of perfect recall. He was able to repeat all the sutras or discourses that the Buddha had ever given. He could even recite them word for word. And since Ananda had always stayed by the Buddha's side as his attendant, he had always been present for all the conversations that the Buddha had with even small groups and individuals. So for the benefit of others, he was able to repeat all these conversations and teachings. And where as possible, other monks verified what Ananda had told them and all the teachers were then given the seal of approval by the council. There was also another monk named Upali, who was an expert on the rules of monks and nuns. He could recollect all the rules, as well as all the stories behind why the rules were made. So Upali repeated all the teachings before the 500 arhats, and once these were heard, these were also approved by the council. Eventually, all the teachings were compiled systematically into what is called the Pali Canon, or the Tripitaka. Tree means tree, and pitaka means basket, so it literally means the three baskets. And the reason for this name is because it was made up of three collections. The first collection is the Vinaya Pitaka. These are the precepts for both monks and nuns and the stories behind them, which is what the monk Upali recollected. And there are three books belonging to this collection. The second basket is the Sutra Pitaka, which contains all the discourses and popular teachings of the Buddha. It contains five volumes, also known as Dakayas, and these are the Diganakaya, which is the collection of long discourses, Majjhima Nakaya, the collection of middle length discourses, Sanyutta Nakaya, the Kyudu sayings, Anguttara Nakaya, the graduate collection, and the Kudaka Nakaya, the compact discourses. The Kudaka Nakaya is the largest volume and has 15 to 18 books. The reason for the difference in number is because some traditions, such as Burmese and Thai, will include some books but omit others. Two of the most popular books is in the Kudaka Nikaya are the Dhammapada, which are short verses spoken by the Buddha on various occasions, and the Jataka, which are the stories that the Buddha told about his previous lives. Since there are 16 other books in the Kudaka Nikaya, I'll list the other 16 on my website and provide you with some online links to some of them. Now, the third basket that makes up the true Pitaka is the Abhidharma. These are defined as the higher teaching, and they include teachings on metaphysics, consciousness, and it details the process of birth and death. The Abhidharma contains seven books. It says that the Buddha taught the essence of the Abhidharma to Sariputra, who was one of the Buddha's foremost disciples, and Sariputra then codified it into its present form. Of all the Pitakas, the Abhidharma is the most difficult to read and understand. It doesn't make for light reading. In fact, it said that the only some parts of the Abhidharma were recited in the first Buddhist council. It wasn't until the third Buddhist council, around 250 BC, that it was compiled into the present form and accepted as the final Pitaka. 
So the Tripitaka is also known as the Pali Canon because it was written down in the Pali language and these are the scriptures that are most revered and studied by the practitioners of Theravada Buddhism. It said it took about seven months for the completion of the first Buddhist council and for all the teachings to be recited and approved. These teachings were then divided into parts so that the 500 arhats were assigned the duty of remembering certain sections which they would have then asked their disciples to memorize and so on and so on. Therefore, the teachings were passed by a reliable oral tradition. Then later in the first century, during the fourth Buddhist council, the teachings were written down on palm leaves and made into books. Now, if you're just starting out in Buddhism and you're interested in reading about the Buddhist teachings, generally the easiest and most popular reading would be the Dhammapada, or perhaps one of the Nikayas, like the Machima Nikaya, which is a collection of Middle East discourses. But an even better introduction to Buddhism would perhaps be one of the many books written by modern day Buddhist teachers who have the ability ex to extract the essence of the Buddhist teachings and transmit it in an everyday language that we can all understand. So to help you out, I've compiled a list of some great Buddhist books that you can find on my website under the suggested reading section. There are some books there that I'm sure you will love. So that concludes my talk on the Tripitaka and the First Buddhist Council. Make sure you subscribe to my channel for future videos Please like, my, like and comment if you found this video helpful. Go and check out the list of Buddhist books I recommended on my website, enthusiasticbuddhist.com, and comment below if you have any other suggestions for books that you think are great for beginners. So take care, everyone, and I hope to see you in the next episode. So this introduction to Mendeley Kuma. So the, these different teachers have different uh, ranges. Some are looking you know, to go quite deep, and there you will find very many deep teachers. Some are just like bite sized chunk size like that, just sort of roughly what's it about. I just want to dabble, I don't want to go in too heavily. And so, like, if anyone who thinks, yeah, I'm going to go for the Abbey Dump, that's what it's the heaviest stuff, I'm going to plunge right in there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. It's something like if you're interested in Apple computers and using one, yeah, you will learn a little bit about, about Steve Jobs, but you don't have to read all the history of JavaScript and look from the, you know, sort of the, the programming language from back in the 80s and the 70s. And the, that, that won't necessarily help, you know, you to, to be able to have and use uh, a computer for benefit, okay? So, Abhi is sometimes translated as too much Dhamma, as well, Abhi Dhamma. It can be very, very, like, uh, just very, very confusing. I don't want you to get confused. So, uh, the books that she mentioned here, um, I, I agree, it's uh, almost wholeheartedly with uh, what she just said about some of these books. So, what I did was to go to her website and then snapshot some of them and list them up here. This is uh, what I put together to save you having to do it, you know. And she also includes quite a lot of other books that I, that I don't know, that I can't say about. But these ones, they're pretty good, they're okay. These are very, very good. Uh, uh, this one, all of these ones that are coming up are um, good, easy to read. I wouldn't recommend plunging into the Majimu Nikaya, it's complex. All of those uh, five are. Uh, I'd recommend more uh, four of them than the other. Um, okay, no, that's no. I'd, I'd recommend. Uh, oh, not that easy. Anyway, I would, uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, I'd recommend not so much the going for one personally. This is be very. This is a very very good compilation from one of the main modern translators, Joseph Goldstein, an American who's been teaching now for about forty five uh, years. Uh, very, very good. Uh, what the Buddha taught, this is one of the early classics. Uh, very, very solid, very, very good. And mindfulness in plain English, these, these are very, very good. This one's a little bit more stylized. Um, I won't go into the whole history of it. Um, but if you want to look for beginner good books, those, I'd recommend those four a little bit more than that one. But generally all good. You'll also find on her website tons of Tibetan stuff I can't vouch for. I don't know what about them. So then a Mahayana group um, called Four Guan Shan. Um, uh, yeah, there we go, we'll just play. Um, they're talking about the spread of Mahayana Buddhism that went up into China. Uh, I was hoping to be able to zoom in, some of the, the details they've got on this one are a little bit small to read, but uh, a bit difficult to zoom in on this. So the birth of the Buddha, 560. Death of the Buddha, old century.
up into Europe around this time, 12th century, and then across to America in 1899, San Francisco, the first monks going over there, Taiwan, and we got LA as well, and then Sydney, 1995, Africa, oh sorry, 